Welcome to the first video in Linguistics 101. This video is going to focus on an introduction to the field of linguistics and what it is that we're actually going to do in this class. In addition, I'll be touching on some things that linguists do beyond this class for a living. So with a course like Introduction to Linguistics, it seems pretty reasonable to start off with the question, what is linguistics? Linguistics is usually defined as the scientific study of language, which I guess is a fine definition, although it does require you to know what language is and what it means for something to be scientific. So let's break it down. First, we have the idea of science. Science is the systematic investigation of natural phenomena. It's based around the creation of testable and falsifiable ideas. These ideas make predictions, which are in turn falsifiable and testable. And science often makes use of empirical evidence. That is to say, evidence that we can see or hear or some way measure. Language, on the other hand, is a system of communication that is specific to human animals. While most animals have some way of communicating in a rich capacity, human language is unique in that we have found seven attributes that set it apart. The first is creativity. Language is creative and you can use it to describe or say anything about anything. The sentence, Joe Exotic is Steve Irwin's Wario, is probably not something that's ever been said before I stole it from Reddit. And yet we were able to just create the sentence out of thin air. In the same way, I can describe something that I've never really seen before, regardless of what it actually is. Well, I, I probably can't, but professional authors can. The second unique component of human language is generality, which is to say that all languages have grammar. Now, when we talk about grammar, we mean components that define how a language works. This is different than what most people mean when they talk about grammar. We are talking about not things like when to use a comma, when to capitalize, or when to use who versus whom. Instead, a language's grammar is made up of the following components. First, we have phonetics, which are the rules of the actual sounds or hand shapes produced and processed in language. Then we have phonology, which is the rules of how these sounds or hand shapes are actually organized and processed in our mind, rather than from the physical components. After that, we have morphology, which is how words are formed from sounds or shapes, followed by syntax, which are the rules of how sentences are formed from words. And then finally, and most abstractly, we have semantics the rules of how meaning is formed at all of these levels. All languages have a grammar that is composed of these five levels, but the specific rules that each language specifies are different. For example, Nuchanalth, an indigenous language on Canada's west coast, has rules to allow the t sound, while English's grammar does not, despite the fact that it's objectively the best sound in human speech. Despite these sounds being part of different inventories, that is, these languages, English and Neutrano, have different sets of sounds, both languages have a grammar and rules on how to allow these sounds to combine. Number three is parity. Although all languages differ in some way, no language is better or more advanced than another. Because all languages can describe all things due to their creativity, there is no language that is inherently better at something than another. No natural language, that is. You may have heard that some words are untranslatable, and so you may think that some languages can talk about concepts easier or better or in an entirely different way than others. I'd like to make it clear that this is a myth no idea is untranslatable. Some languages may have a single word for something, 
and others may need an entire sentence or multiple sentences to describe it. But ultimately, all languages can describe the same information. Another part of this is that no language is more correct, more advanced, or more rational than any other. This is especially true for what some people call dialects. It is often assumed that Appalachian English, regularly called hillbilly by classists, or African American vernacular English, or African American English, often called Ebonics by racists, are supposedly lazy versions of this pristine English. In fact, there's nothing less academic or advanced about these varieties. They have grammars, just like English, that I'm speaking, although their rules may differ, and they're able to describe whatever they need to, in the same way that the English I'm speaking can describe whatever I need to. These languages may have different sounds and sentence structures, but they are just as valid and capable as the English that I'm speaking to you now. If you take nothing else from this course, what I want you to take away is that the idea that some dialects are less capable or less valid than others, or that some dialects are more capable or more valuable than others, is actually just a result of classism and racism and has no basis in fact. Number four is universality. Now, this topic is a controversial one, as true universals, things that occur in all languages, seem relatively rare. There are over 7,000 languages in the world, and so it's relatively difficult to go through all of those and find something that is common. So I'm going to be pretty brief with this. All languages are said to share some things in common. According to some, all languages distinguish between nouns and verbs, although this claim is not universally agreed upon, as there are some indigenous languages of Canada and the United States that seem not to treat nouns and verbs any differently. One universal that actually does seem to be apparent in all languages is that all languages seem to contain pronouns or some sort of pronominal part of speech. Number five is the mutability of language. All grammars change over time. This is why Latin eventually split into the Romance languages. It's why Old English is mutually unintelligible to people who are only speaking Modern English, like I am right now. And it's why you might see differences in the way that you or your grandparents spoke. Few people use terms like Chesterfield or Davenport nowadays. Maybe some people are using serviette, but even that's relatively rare. You might see people whining about how language today is going down the drain because the children are saying things like, I can't even, or aren't using the word whom. The reality is, these people are probably just crotchety old people who need to get a life. Languages change. When languages don't change, they're dead. I guess. Number six, inaccessibility means that grammar is subconscious. Without formal education or reflection, people generally do not consciously know the rules of their native language. Probably the best example of this is asking people to explain when to use who versus whom, was versus where, as in if I was rich or if I were rich, and why the T sound in butter sounds different than the T sound in butt. Now, all of these instances have explanations, but most people, unless they've consciously sat through and thought about it or studied linguistics, aren't able to give you the rules for these examples. This is what we mean by grammar is subconscious. They're able to use these instances properly. They are able to make butter sound different than but. And they might even be able to use who versus whom or was versus were. But they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you because language is something that we develop subconsciously. 
These six points are the essence of language and help define what linguists study. Linguistics is not, for example, concerned with whether or not a sentence is quote unquote correct in a formal use. Linguistics does not concern itself with which language is most beautiful or most logical, just as most scientists and biologists don't criticize whales for being mammals that return to the sea. A linguist would never seriously criticize a language for having or not having a particular feature, like, say, grammatical gender. So if we know the components of language, and we know that linguistics is the scientific study of language, then what does that actually look like? And how do we actually engage in this science? Well, linguistics is generally an academic discipline. Most of our work revolves around running experiments where we stick people in a sound booth and record them or record their brain waves, asking them for judgments on acceptability ratings, looking at pre-written texts and using computational tools to tease out information, or working in communities to help preserve and revitalize languages. There actually aren't a lot of jobs for people to study how human language works outside of university, but there are some. Here's just three because this video is getting long for a short introduction, and there's not all that many opportunities. So one, probably the most common, is linguists with computational skills are regularly employed by companies like Amazon or Google to help engineer voice assistants or automatic text processing for data processing purposes. Now that said, Getting an undergraduate degree in linguistics will almost certainly not prepare you for this job. You'll need to get a, have a major, at least in computer science, get another computer science degree, or maybe do a master's in computational linguistics specifically. That said, it's a very in-demand field, and salaries are relatively good. Another route is that many linguistic students often go on to pursue other schooling. So I graduated from a bachelor's degree and I went on to pursue a PhD. But other students will, may go on to pursue things like communication and science disorder studies or audiology studies. Um, they may also go through speech pathology, which is a specific form of communication science and disorder studies. These are healthcare oriented professions that focus on helping people with all sorts of disorders. You may have thought that a speech pathologist is just a speech therapist who tells people how to pronounce their R's or how not to quote unquote lisp. But in fact, speech pathologists are important across the board because they help people with swallowing disorders or with speech problems following a stroke. They also offer speech therapy for people who are being misunderstood or having difficulty being understood for whatever reason. So they do do some amount of accent reduction. The final opportunity that I'm going to cover is that, and this is pretty rare, some advertising agencies will help linguists to come up with brand names that people can subconsciously associate with some idea or feeling. Similarly, technical writing and other similar jobs will hire students with linguistics degrees because most students who come out of a degree in linguistics have relatively strong writing skills they have general argumentation skills, and they know the ways that people interact with language that people don't generally think about. Now, obviously, these are just a few of the things that linguists do. Most positions require at least a master's degree in the subject. If you're interested in more specific subfields of linguistics, you can come talk to me, shoot me an email, maybe ask in the anonymous form, or you can take Linguistics 102, where you'll actually be going through each of these in much greater depth, each of the individual subfields. So that's it for this video, where we covered what languages, what linguistics does, what linguistics doesn't do. The next lecture is going to focus on our first component of grammar, that is semantics. I'll see you all there.